Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today. My name is Shane Gibson. I'm an author, professional speaker, as well as a business trainer. And when I'm not doing that, I work with Sprott Shaw College and their advisor team at the 16 campuses across the province, supporting them. Before we start today, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Indigenous Peoples Territories we're broadcasting and attending from, from today. I personally would like to acknowledge that I live, work, and play on the unceded territories of the Tsleil-Waututh, Musqueam, and Squamish nations here in Vancouver. While we meet today on a virtual platform, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the lands which we each call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and to improve our own understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their cultures. On the eve of the first National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, it's also vital that we reflect and acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and consider how we can each in our own way try to move forward in the spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. At Sprout Shaw College, we help students like you find your passion and purpose. Today, we're discussing human services careers featuring our addictions worker program, community support worker, social service program, and professional counselors program. You can expect from each speaker, we've got four guest speakers, they'll be speaking for about five to 10 minutes each. And as they speak, you know, make note of your questions or feel free to put them right directly into the chat. If you click on chat, you can actually type in your questions. We'll log and save those. And at the end, we're gonna have a panel of all the speakers who at that time will address all of your questions about the various programs and even offer the opportunity for some more continued dialogue at the end of the program through chat and interacting with the uh, various instructors and guests. So by the end of the day, our goal is that we hope you've learned everything you want to know about Sprout Shaw's human services programs. Uh, we have many exciting stories and learnings to share here today. So I'm gonna quickly go through the list of speakers and then I'm going to ask our first speaker to come up. So here's who will be here with us today. First will be Nelson Cito. Nelson is Human Services Programs Coordinator and Curriculum Developer for Professional Counseling Program. Then we'll have Swarn Dollywall. Swarn is Employment Services Specialist at Sprott Shaw, Outreach Support Worker at Women Resource Society of Fraser Valley as well. Then we've got Tal East. Tal is a tribal, tribal health educator, harm reduction specialist with Southeast Reforce Development Council Corporation. And then, of course, we've got Jean Norkia, a student enrolled in the professional counseling program who will share her insights and experiences as, as a student in the organization. So without further ado, what I'd like to do now is introduce Nelson. So uh, Nelson is the Human Services Programs Coordinator uh, and one of the curriculum writers for the PCD program. He completed his master's in counseling psychology at Adler University and has been practicing as a registered clinical counselor since 2012. His experience includes working in the public system, working in health authority, nonprofit agencies, as well as for-profit agencies, employee assistance programs, private practice, uh, and in the Ministry of Children and Family Development. He has supervised students in their master's degrees and postgraduate therapists as well. He has also instructed at two private institutes in counseling and related programs. Thank you very much for joining us, Nelson. Thank you, Shane. Uh, hi, everyone. It's uh, great to have you here. Um, so yeah, I'm just gonna spend a couple of minutes here to introduce um, the professional counseling diploma program to uh, everyone here watching. So, um, just to start off is that uh, the counseling program is in its inaugural year and we are continuously working to improve and to uh, evaluate the program um, endlessly and tirelessly to make sure that we're providing the most professional and the most effective and relevant um, content to all our students. Um, and that is because we have run the program, designed the program with the spirit of um, producing ethical, uh, moral, and high standard practitioners. Um, our program is designed um, with a scholar practitioner model. What that means is that we're looking at combining the uh, uh, educational knowledge 
that you get from textbooks and um, educational um, resources and how that applies in real life situations in the counseling uh, room with a real life person um, when you uh, will be meeting with clients in the future. So based on that kind of intention, we are, uh, we have always had a lot of uh, practice um, type of um, content activities, a lot of dyadic work in pairs, um, and tons and tons of recordings uh, to get used to the idea of recording, which is a big, big component to many, many practicum um, sites and practicum experiences. Uh, we also uh, make sure that we uh, have a lot of um, real practical uh, trainings in things such as suicide risk assessments, um, as well as cultural safety uh, and other really, really crucial documentations, reports, writing type of um, uh, educational uh, experiences. This makes our program um, really, really strong to provide uh, our students a foundation when they are ready to go into, uh, not only into the actual field, but also in the practicum sites. Uh, because a lot of practicum sites are looking for students who have these trainings. Um, that will kind of make things a lot more smoother. So everything is designed with that intent. Um, the primary um, kind of heart of our program is that we want to not only have ethical um, practitioners, but really practitioners who are working from a place of compassion and heart. So a lot of our uh, course content does include reflective uh, exercises and activities to really uh, understand your own development, how the content you're being um, uh, discussed impacts you as a practitioner now and as later on in the future. Um, our program is in accordance um, in with the uh, direction of helping our students become registered with the two organizations. Uh, one is the CPCA um, and the one is ACCT. Both of these organizations uh, are governing bodies uh, for counselors um, in this area. So our program is geared towards that um, to help our students become registered. We even include a um, preparatory course on the CPCA's qualifying exam uh, to ensure our students are going to be successful in passing the exam. Uh, and a big part of our um, program is actually focused as well on supporting students uh, for practicum when they're in the practicum site as well. So we are looking at how to make all, um, have all of our students um, have what they need to be ready for the field as entry level practi practitioners um, at the other end. So that's kind of our program in a nutshell. There's probably a lot more other questions and whatnot um, that we might answer at the end. Um, but yeah, that's the program in a nutshell. Thank you very, very much, Nelson. I'm sure we will have a, a few questions for you popping in the chat here uh, at the uh, tail end of the program. I want to now uh, introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is Swarn Dollywall. Uh, Swarn has been working with Sprockshaw College for the past eight years and teaching for the last six years. For the last 12 years, she's worked with women fleeing domestic violence, going through postpartum depression and other mental health challenges, uh, has three undergraduate degrees in business, general studies and counseling, and is currently doing her master's degree in psychology and hoping to start your PhD uh, in the next two years. She's a mother of two teenagers, age 15 and almost 18 years old, and has a passion to support and empower others, especially women, to follow their passion and live fulfilling lives. Thank you very much for joining us, Swarn. Thank you, Shane, for having me. Um, thank you for bringing me to this platform. So as you mentioned that I've been teaching the Community Support Worker Program for the past six years, um, a program that I have absolute passion for. I love teaching this program because I believe in this program. So what does the Community Support Worker Program do? At uh, What does it prepare our students with? 
Uh, so community support worker program that we have as Prasha, it emphasizes quality of life, fosters inclusion and promotes self-determination while assisting with life skills, development and full participation in the community. So students are required to complete a 200 hour practicum um, in a community-based agency, they could do it in a nonprofit, for-profit, government, schools, you name it. So is there a demand for community uh, support workers? And I wanna speak a little bit to what Shane mentioned about me teaching this program. Having worked um, in the field for the past about 12 years now, um, working with women fleeing domestic violence, working with the women going through depression, um, working with parents of young children. There's so much value to be added. And there's such a demand for this type of a work. And I can even speak more to that now, having all of us have been in this pandemic since almost for the past two years, almost over 18 months. And there will be no shortage of work in this field, um, to say the least. If anything, we are going to see more and more demand, especially in mental health workers. So the demand for community support workers is very high. As I mentioned, because we are working more and more with the vulnerable groups, vulnerable populations, um, whether we're talking about addiction, whether we're talking about um, mental health crisis itself, whether we're talking about domestic violence, as we might have seen uh, for the past year, police has got more phone calls related to intimate partner violence than they have in the previous years. So why would you choose Sprasha? Why would you want to come to Sprasha? Why do, do, do you choose to do community support worker program at Sprasha? Well, there are a few reasons. Um, one of the biggest things that I can speak to, the way our program is run, the way we run our courses, you get a lot of one-on-one -on -one attention because we do have smaller classes. Having gone through myself to SFU and then Kwantlen, currently studying at Adler for my master's, um, when you are in a group, in a classroom, over let's say 200, 250, 400 students. I'm not sure about you guys, but I definitely do not learn much. For me to pay attention, I need more of a focused group, a smaller group. So having gone through, having completed three undergrads, that was one of the things I actually really did not like about having courses at SFU, for example, where you are in a theater of 400 students, your instructors, the professors are speaking in mics, if you're like me, where your mind wanders off, um, I used to wander off, obviously, mentally, and not pay attention to anything my instructors would say. So that's one of the biggest things I see as a benefit, um, bonus, or, or a, something that, I guess, gives us a little bit of a competitive edge. Having that smaller classroom, having one-on-one, -on -one, having the ability to interact with your instructors more on one-on-one, -on -one, getting the help you need, and then having access to employment services specialists. So your employment service specialist is someone that helps you with your practicum. Now, you might come in and say, well, we just you know put me wherever there is practicum availability. Or what I really truly encourage our students to do is sort of think about where they want to work, what organizations they really align themselves with, what brought them to this place, this, this work um, line of work. So, you know, having, um, if, if we're answering those questions and then aligning ourselves with organizations where we see ourselves eventually working, so where employment service specialists can come handy and they do come in handy, they can help us connect to those organizations, whether it's making phone calls to them, whether it is emailing them, whatever it might be. Why I think it's a benefit, as I mentioned earlier, when I initially, when I did my first undergrad, which was my bachelor's in entrepreneurial leadership, which was business, I remember finishing my program, and this is honest to God truth. And when I finished, I graduated, got my degree, and I remember sitting home that summer thinking, where am I going now? 
what does this degree mean now? Where am I going to work? Because I did not have anyone help me through as I was completing my bachelor's, as I was completing my undergrad. And the other thing I always joke with my students, currently, as I mentioned earlier, I'm doing my master's. So in my master's, I am also required to do practicum. And it is a, it is 200 hour practicum. So I get an email, I started my master's last year. I get an email from my program coordinator saying, so Swarn, uh, send me the contact information of the person or a place where you're planning to do your practicum. And I'm like, oh, I wasn't prepared that I'm doing all of this on my own. So I didn't even know where I was allowed to go and do my practicum or not. But you know, after long conversations back and forth with her, eventually I ended up finding a practicum placement for myself. But I remember going through that stress and not having someone that is saying that is there for you. Someone that says, you know what, how I can guide you. What we're saying is we are willing to assist and we do assist. We do provide the support that is necessary. And um, of course, the other thing I really like about our program is the condensed uh, time frame. A course that you might be doing in two, three, four weeks with us um, typically will take you, let's say, three months, a fall semester at mo most of the other institutions. And we do have affiliations as um, college with other organizations like Canadian. I mean, for example, like I work in the Vancouver region. So we have affiliation with um, Coast Mental Health. We have affiliations with Directions Youth Services. We have currently affiliated with Covenant House. We are currently now in the process of aligning with AIDS BC. So we're, we are, and the other one that is uh, work in progress is ISS of BC, the Immigrant Services and Refugee Organization. So we are constantly trying to align ourselves or create affiliations with other, with other organizations so we can support our students. Um, it's great to come and do the program. It's great to finish your diploma. It is great. You know, those of us that might have gone and gotten degrees. But it is disappointing when you've done all that work and now you need to go out and find job or find work and you have no idea how to start. So having someone that is there to assist you, someone who's going to help you, someone who is saying, you know, here we do have certain availabilities or and the other thing we also get from our ESSs or in general in Sprasha is for our even alumni, job openings or job placements that come up. We do share that with our students. So having said all of that, we, the Community Support Worker Program, the Diploma Program at Sprasha, the program that I teach, um, it is quite, um, it is very elaborative. It, it is comprehensive. We cover over 20 courses in a period of 10 months. We go from mental health, aging, um, addictions, um, social work courses in Canada. We look at the indigenous populations in Canada, the challenges, unique challenges facing that specific population at the moment. So we go through working with youth. Uh, we're looking at intimate partner violence. So the, there's about two, over 20 courses that we cover. Um, and I think um, I have said everything I had and I look forward to questions that you guys might have for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Swarn Dollywall. You gave Thanks, us a really, really good view of your program, but also I appreciate uh, you taking the time to really dig into some of the uh, additional supports that each campus provides the students, which I think you know makes a, a huge difference uh, in our education process uh, and yeah. the environment and community it creates. So you know, thank yeah. you very much. Thank you, Shane. So our our next speaker. Uh, is, uh, I believe, the, uh, you know, logging in from quite far away, at least not in British Columbia, uh, but I'll, I'll allow her to expand upon that. But uh, Tal East is a tribal health educator, harm reduction specialist with Southeast Resource Development Council Corporation of Manitoba, uh, where she coordinated STWBI 
and HIV, substance misuse, and harm reduction education and services programs. So that's quite a, a mouthful and quite an extensive uh, number of programs. Tal's career is diverse and spans over 20 years of adult education and addiction services. Formerly the director of Manitoba's only detoxification and stabilization unit, as well as the former director of Addiction Foundation of Manitoba Provincial Men's Services. She brings vast knowledge surrounding mental health and addiction in a Canadian context, both through her studies as well as through lived experience. Tao played a key role in developing the Addictions and Community Service Worker Diploma Program in Manitoba and taught the pilot program before becoming a, camp, uh, a campus as its director for 10 plus years. Tal is also deeply involved in the child welfare system in Manitoba, having fostered many children and is currently a foster mom to three deserving children. With the help of the children, her spouse and friends, she also runs a livestock sanctuary where she can be often seen hugging a cow, pony, or alpaca. I might have to put that on my schedule of things to do when I head to Manitoba next. Tal holds a Bachelor of Education degree, a Business Administration Diploma, and an Addiction and Community Service Diploma. Thank you very much for joining us, Tal. Thank you for having me. And I'd like to start by um, acknowledging that I'm coming to you from the ancestral lands of Treaty 1 territory, traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and of the home, on the homeland of the Métis people. Um, Anin Boju, uh, very nice to see everybody, and I'm, I'm thrilled to have been invited to uh, speak to you in this forum. Um, it's a, a little different for me to speak to boxes with names and not see the faces and reactions of the people that I'm speaking to, but I'm very excited uh, to tell you that I did check out the names on um, the little side panel. And uh, like the hosts of this uh, webinar that you've attended today, I see that it's quite a diverse group of people, um, people from all backgrounds, which is exactly what we need in today's environment of mental health and addictions. As Shane mentioned, um, I've been a part of developing the original Addiction and Community Service Worker Program in Manitoba that then spanned across the country to uh, various independent and private colleges. Um, and many of those colleges across the country today still teach the same Addiction and Community Service Worker Program. However, um, what I can tell you is that I'm also involved in, in developing the curriculum for the program that you're looking at in the addictions field in Sprachow College. And I can tell you that uh, the current program that you will be going into is modernized. It fits today's environment and political landscape. Um, and it covers topics that perhaps 10 years ago we didn't talk about, we weren't as aware of, um, or we weren't comfortable sharing with, about. Um, so, for example, harm reduction. Um, in my introduction, you heard that in my day-to-day -day work role, I'm also a harm reduction specialist. And harm reduction was something that um, 10 years ago, even five years ago, um, many places didn't talk about. Um, we didn't talk much about overdose and overdose prevention. We looked at things like harm reduction as an enabling force that allows people to continue to use drug, drugs or misuse drugs. When in reality, um, we now know and are much more educated globally as well as in the Canadian context about harm reduction being the thing that saves lives. Um, for example, uh, people cannot recover if they're dead. And that sounds um, brutally honest, and it is. Um, so in the Addiction and Community Service Worker Program, there's a lot of room for employment within the field of addiction, and now also harm reduction, which wasn't available um, for support employees uh, about 10 years ago. So that is a whole new genre and a whole new arm to the field of mental health and addictions that has very, very many possibilities, whether it's um, being someone with lived experience who's chosen to take this program and become an addictions community service support worker, um, you are also then known as a peer. And in our current climate, peers play a significant role in support and support services for those 
living with mental health and addictions um, situations or challenges. Um, as So peers, if you're one of those people that ended up looking at this course because of lived experience, you already bring with you vast knowledge that cannot be learned in a book, but that can only assist you once you get the technical bits um, of this type of, of job. For example, report writing or um, interviewing skills or what does an open-ended question mean when you're speaking to someone, um, how to support people and meet them with where they're at. We hear that lingo all the time, but what does it actually mean? So those kinds of things you will learn in the variety of courses that are within the program, but what you bring into it yourself, your person, your experience, your background, the things that are individual and unique to you, um, are, are the things that will kind of take you over the top when it comes to working with your employment services department um, and really emphasizing on all those strengths that you have. Um, so definitely harm reduction is a huge field that is not talked about very often when it comes to these types of diploma courses. And of course, um, it's already been touched on that mental health and addictions uh, we're seeing a huge rise in overdoses, a huge rise in use, and a huge rise in people who don't use, but are really feeling the effects of isolation um, and loneliness since the, the pandemic has kept us away from each other um, and indoors. And so um, there is a lot of funding that is going to a lot of very deserving organizations, new organizations and new programs that will need to be staffed with people who um, are taking these courses. And as you've heard, Sprocha is affiliated with many organizations that are funded by whether it's provincial government or federal government in this type of work. And having that affiliation is another step up towards succeeding um, once you graduate from, from this program. I will also urge you um, that if you're on the fence and you're not sure about whether you should take this course at Sprocha or not, or this program at Sprocha or not. Um, maybe start volunteering at some places that offer the services that you would be qualified for uh, once you, if you were to graduate from the program. So volunteer at homeless shelters, volunteer at housing first um, programs, volunteer at youth at risk programs, refugee programs, indigenous programs, and really immerse yourself in the diversity of communities that this type of work assists once you're successful um, at attaining this diploma. Um, I think that's really all I have to say right now. I don't even know how long I've been speaking, but uh, I hope that you have some questions and that I'm able to um, help you figure out if this is the right place for you and, or the right course for you. And uh, if you think it's the right course, I can assure you that Sprocha is the right place um, and that you will be getting the most up-to-date information and learning possible. Thank you very much, Tal. I'm sure there'll be a few more questions for you here uh, at the end. Uh, what I'd like to do now is uh, introduce uh, Jean Nokia. Uh, and Jean is a South African uh, immigrant that's been here in Canada for three years, uh, comes from a dental background, has been working as a sales representative for about 10 years in the dental field, and is actually still working right now for a dental supply company based out of uh, Toronto. Uh, she's now enrolled in the professional counselor program, a counseling program, and it's something she's all wanted to do and had a passion for it to really help others overcome and cope with issues in their lives with a specific interest in family and relationship counseling. Thank you very much for joining us. Looking forward to hearing your story. Hi, everyone. So can, you can all hear me, right? Absolutely. We can see okay. you and hear you. Sure. Awesome. Um, so I don't have such an impressive resume as all of the rest of the panelists here tonight. So I'm just going to like wing it. <laughs> Nelson also sort of stepped on everything I was going to say. So I think um, one thing that I would like to add that I really like about the program and especially Sprawl College is that it is very condensed and because of the smaller classes, there is a lot more one-on-one -on -one interaction with um, your instructors. And uh, I don't know about other classes, but in our cohort, everybody sort of become this small family. We've all become very close friends because there is only, I think, eight of us 
in the class at the moment. Um, so it is focused on mental health, much like all the other courses. Um, we do cover a very wide range of topics. And as a student, you are required to do a lot of self-reflection, especially since a lot of the topics can be triggering for some because of past experiences. So I think because of that, um, in the program self-care, it's one of the first things that you learn about. And that is very important. It's something I didn't know anything about when I started this course. And I'm very grateful that we did it like within the first or second, I think, course that we did, um, we did do. Um, I think you have to be committed to be a lifelong learner. I don't think everything that you learn in this course is gonna be applicable in 10 years time, but, but I believe that it does give you a very comprehensive baseline and you are able to go into practice right after graduation. Um, yeah, so about the course, the instructors are great and they are very um, involved, very, I, I don't want to say lenient, but I want to say like understanding. And if you're having trouble with anything, they're always there to help, which is great. Um, there is a lot of reading and a lot of writing, both academic and general. So be ready for that. And if I, the second language, sec English second language speaking person can do it, I believe so can you. Um, I think that's all that I have for now. So if there's any questions, I would welcome them. Fantastic. And that's a, a, a good cue, actually. We're going to maybe get uh, all of the uh, guest speakers to light your, your cameras up again. And uh, because we're going to move into the question and answer period. So uh, we've got a, a few questions here. Uh, and let's see here. So, um, and I think this is for uh, a lot of them are pretty broad and there are some program specific questions I see. So I'll ask, I'll start with sort of maybe a bit of a broad question is what type of employment opportunities are in the respective sectors of the programs you're responsible for or uh, taking? So what type of, you know, employment opportunities are available? Nelson, you want to start? Can I put you on the, the 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 spot to start? You you look like you were ready, so sure. Let's go. Ahead. Let's do it. Um, yeah, the 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 employment opportunities in the counseling um world is actually fairly broad. Um, it can go anywhere from working for nonprofits, agencies, um all the way to like private practice. Um, many, many people do go into private practice, whether it's you are your own um, boss uh, kind of speaking, or you join someone else's private practice and be an associate. Um, that is majority of counselors in the field, just because that's where the money is. Um, but a lot of people um, for their own, you know, personal reasons and social justice reasons uh, will also work, um, in nonprofits that mean something to them. Um, and uh, a big part of it has to also um, be mindful of you know, where you did your practicum at, which will kind of enhance your skill set, enhance your experience, clinical experience, uh, which makes uh, sense to why you might continue working in that area uh, or maybe in that exact agency um, where you do your practicum at. So yeah, the, the range is quite large in regards to counseling um, employment cases. Thank you. Tal, Swarn, do you wanna talk about some of the opportunities? Yeah, sure, Shane. When, in regards to if you're looking at community support worker, um, if I look at my own student population where most of them are working or where there's potential, uh, getting hired with even uh, Vancouver School District. Some of my students are working with Vancouver School District um, as support workers. Um, some are getting hired. Like I mentioned earlier when I was speaking, the demand in the mental health 
field. And I think all you also mentioned that as well. It's almost like we are going through a mental health crisis to be, un to be honest, and it's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. And any of my students in the last six months that have gone for practicum with Coast Mental Health, which is the Vancouver Richmond region, they are getting hired right out of their practicums. That's how much the demand is. They're getting, they're having very hard time keeping up. So Coast Mental Health or mental health in general, working in um, like school districts, working, um, I just had a, one of my students who is being offered a job with AIDS BC. Um, he did his practicum, he got offered there. Um, working in addictions, like youth services, addictions. Um, one of the organizations we deal with is downtown of, in Vancouver on Broad Street called Directions Youth Services. Uh, my students are getting hired with them. We are also, we, we have people that are working at Covenant House. That, that is another youth center, but they have a sort of a different criteria. They provide similar services, but one is more when the person is sort of already walking the path of recovery, whereas Directions is more, you know, if someone is, they're homeless, they need to go to a place. Directions is that organization. Uh, where else are they working? Um, we are, I have students working with IESS of BC, which is the immigrant settlement refugee organization, uh, other community resource places. People are working with uh, women uh, fleeing domestic violence. Women are working with Atira. So the list can go on. It's a huge list. And that's one of the things I really love about this program because it opens up the door. Community support work, for example, if I'm saying that's that is a general umbrella. It's the umbrella. You have all these different branches that can come out of that one aspect of the program. So you could literally work with any of these organizations and more as well. I just mentioned some. Anyone else have more to add to that? I think it's quite comprehensive, but I'd love to hear some different perspectives on other career directions available through the programs. I find that a lot of people that have graduated from the Addiction and Community Service Worker Program also go into child protection and child protection agencies, that type of social service. Um, food security is another one. So working with, um, you know, they're all kind of connected. Um, so all the, the social determinants of health and new thing that determines how a person's well-being is groomed, so to speak, and how they live. So anything that is social, um, anyone graduating from these programs can be successful at. I mentioned earlier that volunteering is a really good good piece and, and a good word of advice because if you're volunteering it all it also already gets your face and your name out there so if there's a, a homeless shelter that you would love to be a caseworker at one day or a support worker at one day uh, start volunteering now do it once a week because you're going to be busy as a student and a comprehensive comprehensive program but do it once a week and get your name out there, get them to know you as well as employers nowadays look at resumes and look for volunteers for volunteer experience. What have you done? What, what is your emotional quote, quotient? So make sure that you are well-rounded in the experience that you're gathering both inside and outside of the classroom and the opportunities are endless, just like uh, Sworn and both Nelson and Illustrated. I do want to add one piece in regards to kind of tagging on to what Tal and Swan have mentioned in regards to um, kind of buffing up your, your resume and your uh, hireability is uh, the volunteering piece. Uh, a good one if you're kind of trying to still feel your way around is the crisis center. Um, it's a phenomenal place uh, that you gain really, really, really strong skill sets there. Uh, in particular with crisis um, situations um, that they're always looking for volunteers and they have really good training there as well. Um, so crisis center is another good place um, to consider for volunteering. Great, all, all great uh, avenues and directions. I, I've got a, a, two questions, they, they came separately but they're, I see them as kind of connected. So I'm gonna kind of ask as a two part question. And, the, and I think this applies to uh, all the programs uh, really is, does lived experience play a role in the success of completing the program? And the other question was, 
if I have lived experience, is this course safe for me to take? Triggers, mental health, mindfulness challenges. So I think it's an interesting combined question is, you know, how does this lived experience impact my success in my chosen path? Um, can, I, can I go first if that's okay? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I think that know, know, you, know you, know yourself, know your triggers, know your boundaries. If you don't know your boundaries, figure them out, search inside, figure them out and make sure that they're, they're set in place. Um, I think uh, Johnny will agree that you need a good support system. Um, if your current system is, is not supportive, you can still build it. Um, so build your army around you, whether it's family or friends, neighbors, peers, co-workers, every situation is going to be different. Could be your children if you're, you know, 50 years old like me, but make sure that you have a good support system around you because it, going to school is never easy, whether it's a comprehensive program or whether it's a, it's a four or five year degree program. Um, there are challenges with going to school, but going to school with a, into a field that you have lived, lived experience that may have posed some challenges in your past make sure you have some supports in place for those times where there are triggers. And I don't know if um, our student wants to add anything to that, because I think you had a child in soccer today. So um, you, you have to make sure that you, you take care of yourself and take care of your family. And remember, if you have children, how is that going to work? Be real, be real with yourself and don't hesitate to ask for help. Sworn. Um, I was going to add to what uh, Tal said. Um, when we think of lived experiences, I feel like lived experiences are actually your power. Mm -hmm. We can teach, we can preach. I could study all the theories. I'll get my PhD one day. Whatever it is, I'll be called Dr. Sworn. All of those things are amazing. They're great. Well, let me tell you one thing, someone who might not have their PhD, but has lived through a life, no degree on this planet equals that lived experience. Your lived experience is your power. That lived experience is what going to inspire your clients. That lived experience is what is going to change the people out there. I work on, um, in the East Van campus. So I have had students who were homeless. I've had students, I got one student right now who is just off the street. Let me tell you, that student's experience and my PhD do not come close. What I know is theoretical. What he knows, he lived through it. We always joke about it, Soren, you should never go into teaching addictions because I only know the theory part of it. My only addiction is chai tea. You got someone who's done it all, seen it, almost died, right? But he made it. So now you combine that lived experience with his diploma, guess what? There's power to that. So your lived experiences are going to be the very thing that will empower. I, I'm very passionate about this because that to me, if I'm speaking to someone who's lived through it and I can look at them, I can talk to them and say, you know what, they went through it. They know what it feels like. They did it. I can do it too. That's where the inspiration comes from. So if you've gone through something in life, don't be ashamed of it. Your very story could be the key to someone's life. The key that unlocks what they've been waiting to unlock. So bring that experience with you, share it with people, share it with your clients. You will inspire your instructors. You don't know who you're inspiring in the classroom as well. Fantastic perspective. I, yeah. I Oops. Nelson, uh, Johnny. Yeah, I was just, uh, I was about to just add on to what Sworn said is that in our classroom, especially, we have learned so much from each other 
from our lived experiences. Because I mean, having lived it and, and theoretically learning it is two very different things. And you see a completely different perspective um, from someone. And even people who has lived through the same thing experiences it differently, which teaches your whole class something and something else to look out for yeah and i wanted to say something about the triggers but i forgot so no i yeah. really I'll great add, insights on that and nelson yeah i'll add a small piece there um everything everyone said is on point like yeah absolutely i agree um that live experiences honestly we all experience things in life that wasn't pleasant um and it is super important for us, um, especially those uh, who are going to be in the helping profession, um, learn how to wield that story, that narrative, to make it a healing story for others. Um, and really, that's the that's what we talk about when I mentioned in the beginning that the program is heart based. Is that you understand it? It's not just like a, I know it. Is a I understand it. Um, and when you have that felt sense. Um, of understanding what your clients are going through, whether it's exactly the same or something slightly different, it's very, very, very powerful compared to I can recite the DSM and it means nothing. Um, so live experience absolutely plays a part. Um, and it's about fine tuning that, um, that, that kind of uh, tool to make it useful for your clients and useful in the clinical settings and useful in all um, populations that's kind of where the program and your experience and uh, supervisors help you sharpen that tool. Uh, but absolutely, it is nothing to be ashamed of, nothing that you would ever want to be uh, hiding. It's something that you need to understand, make sense of, and integrate that into your work. Another question's popped up here. Thank you, Nelson. And I think this is for you as well. So I'll just throw it in since you were just chatting. Uh, is uh, there's a question about uh, registering as a counselor after graduation. Can I do this? What governing bodies recognize the program? What's the process to do so? Yeah, that's a awesome question. Um, yes, you are able to register as a counselor uh, with two organizations, uh, governing bodies, uh, the CPCA, um, and as well as the ACCT. Uh, those are acronyms for very long names of essentially governing bodies in BC for counselors and the governing bodies across Canada. Um, so absolutely, you can register with them uh, and you know liability insurance um, uh, and directories and all that stuff it can be part of that um, as well. Um, each one will have slightly different requirements but our program qualifies for both governing bodies. Um, so you will be registered um, after the program when you register for it. You'll be eligible to register. Great, excellent. So uh, question, and this is uh, probably a broad question. Uh, I have my own answers, but I wanna hear from you uh, in your perspective is, question is like, do I need to come in person for classes? That's a question that's come up now. We, we're transitioning back into the classroom. It's a question most people ask when they sit down with the advisors. That they, so I'm curious to hear your responses to this and, and the why behind it. Who wants to tackle this one? <laughs> well, Nelson. I can. Okay, go, oh, ahead. Nelson, Sworn, go, go ahead. ahead, Nelson. No, 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 Soren, you can go ahead. I'll let yeah. you take this one. <laughs> okay. Ah, I, I love this question. My students were asking me today. Um, as of this month, we've been required to go back to what they call on the ground, at least with the CSW program. There's a couple courses in the program which they have allowed us to keep online. The rest of it, we are on ground. So now the, the question might come, I think Shane, the other part was why or how come we need to go back? Sure. Okay. Or, or just what, what you're, you find the students are getting out of the classroom that maybe wasn't present online. So most of the people, let's say people who are almost at the end of their program. So we've been online since last April, 2020. So 
people that started the program, finished the program or online. Then I have some students who are just starting, but then some who are more than halfway done and they were online. So when we, this whole thing came back that, hey, we're gonna go back, we're gonna be on the ground, we're coming back to class. They said, well, why can't we do it online and let us finish? So long story short, we said, well, come down. Let, let's do, you know, let's do twice a week at the beginning of this month. I said, let's do twice a week and see how you like. You know, after a week goes by, two weeks go by, and they, today they finally said, okay, we know, now we understand why you're saying come back on like in person, it's different. What is different is the socialization aspect of it. Mm -hmm. We're human beings. We need to be around people, especially now than ever. We've been in isolation for almost two years. We're not meant to be in isolation as a human race I'm talking about. Yeah, some of us are more extroverts, some of us are more introverts, but we still need that so socialization aspect of it. Mm -hmm. When you're with people, when you are in the classroom, you get to not only talk about your program, you're not only talking about the courses, you're talking about what you're going through life, what you're feeling, you're sharing things, you're, you know, there's the whole body language aspect of our communication which is missing when we're online. We could try to be all as effective as we like online. Yes, it works, it has worked, we know that. For the past two years, trust me, it is something you would have to experience in person to really see where I'm coming from. Mm -hmm. That's I'm gonna, my, go ahead. I'm gonna add to that as well as, um, yeah, in the uh, counseling program, it is uh, designed as a blended um, uh, program, meaning that you can do some online and some in person, uh, and we've been continuing this, and we're probably going to continue this uh, format. There, I agree with Soren as well, is that there are certain things that when you meet in person, it's going to uh, be missed if you just purely met through the camera. Uh, in particular, of course, the non-verbal uh, non is the body language, but this a human connection that isn't quite the same to do over the camera. Um, I, I, I'm interested to hear Jeanne speak about this as well as a student uh, where you have been doing half and half um, in, in, in person partially and in online partially. I want to kind of hear about your experience uh, doing that. Um, so I'm a little biased because I am a mom and I work full time and I live very far from campus. <laughs> I do prefer the online classes, um, but I gotta say that the learning that takes place and the conversations that take place in person is very different because everybody can quick fire at the same time, whereas online there's that lag and people talking over each other and raised hands that go missed. And so there is a sort of dynamic that is missing um, when you are online. Definitely. And again, the social aspect and just the actual connecting with people, it does make a big difference. So yeah, I do enjoy the blended program. Just seeing everybody every now and again. It's great. So looking at uh, one final question, and this is, uh, and then I've got Johnny, I want to finish with you. I'm going to give you one final question and wrap up the evening after this one. Uh, uh, but uh, a quick question uh, from, from those of us who are instructing programs. Do I need to find my own practicum site? Do I have to go out and do that? Is that my responsibility to go find the employers that are going to place me during my practicum? How does that work? Oh, no, uh, not that's not for you. The next one is. So Nelson, Swarn, anybody want to? speak to that um you are not well the question is do you have to go find your own practicum yeah we encourage what we do we encourage students to find a place where they want to work like i mentioned earlier when i was doing my my talk about the csw program and i said we encourage students to find a place where they see their future 
um, job opportunity. The point, the purpose of practicum is to help you align yourself with a potential job, right? The hope is that you go to your practicum, you do 200 hours and you're offered a job. So now Sprasha might give you a practicum that you not necessarily be thrilled about because we have affiliations with certain organization, right? It depends which campus you're looking at. Each campus has their own affiliations in the area. So they might be affiliated with an organization that you necessarily don't want to work with. Like someone who wants to go work with women fleeing domestic violence or work mainly with women, and our affiliation only might be with addiction, I mean, um, directions, youth services. So my thing, my, one of the recommendations I'm always making my students is to look for organizations where you want to work. And then now let's contact them and see if they're taking practicum students or what tall, I think, Paul, you said it, or Nelson, one of you guys mentioned uh, volunteer work. I think it was Tal that mentioned. I think, and, and I try to have this conversation with my students at the beginning of their program. Once they've gone through maybe, you know, the first month and saying, okay, where do you, some people come in, they know, they're like, Soren, I want to go, I'm going to work with mental health, right? Some people will come in, they're like, I don't know, I want to work with elderly people. But I also like children too. So those are two separate organizations, right? So, and the other thing I do recommend is, hey, you wanna go to, let's say a senior home, you wanna work with elderly people? Well, let's look what's available to us in this region and then maybe contact them and go volunteer, right? And now do we assist them? We absolutely do. We absolutely assist students with a practicum. Um, we can contact the potential practicum placement where they want to go, but we do encourage students to look for practicums in, in, in the exact sense, like where they want to go work, and then we can definitely assist them. And if they end up finding nothing, we do have practicum placements where we will send them. Just want to piggyback on that, if that's okay. Um, Absolutely. There's a portion of the program, uh, one of the courses has a big uh, piece of it that has to do with putting together together your own resource binder and collecting your own community resources. So if you're someone that's coming into the, the program unsure of where you might want to do your practicum, as you build that resource binder, you will learn more and more about the available organizations in your community, and that can totally assist you in, um, in finding a practicum when the time comes. Great. Thank you. So I think that that's a really great answer. And, and, and it's not a yes or no answer from both of you. It's 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 really about as a student being in the driver's seat of your career and knowing, you know, you know, with a good idea of where you may want to work, but also knowing that Sprotshaw College and the team has your back, that we'll help you approach these organizations, we'll help place you if need be but you're also taking a proactive role in your career, which I think is a, is a, good, it's a good blend. Uh, it, it's, it's a nice way of putting it. So what I wanna do is uh, finish off with Johnny and asking this one question uh, to any potential students watching is, is a, what, what someone's gonna be taking the program, let's say they're gonna be two weeks from now is their first day of class in your program that you're in right now uh, with the professional counseling, what advice would you have wished you would have gotten two weeks before you started? Catch up on your sleep now. <laughs> Catch up on your sleep. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. Anything else? Um, uh, well, yeah, I, I really didn't know what I was getting myself into. I was a student very long ago, the last time, and it was sort of a very flaky course. <laughs> <laughs> it really wasn't as intense and comprehensive and condensed as this and so I sort of didn't know what to expect and it was also in the midst of COVID when we started so I was laid off and it was all at home so it was different yes you know I had a lot more time on my hands to get things done so yeah. I think um yeah, the big thing is get your get yourself ready, get your mind ready. It is going to be like a tough routine, 
But as soon as you have your routine and your life figured out and you stick to it, and once again, self-care, very important. Karen will tell you all about that in the first couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah, um, as, as long as you have that systems in place and you have the support in place, you're golden. Fantastic. Well, that's a great note uh, to finish on. I want to thank all of our, our guest speakers for coming on today and sharing your insights. Uh, thank you for joining Sprotshaw College to discuss our human services programs, and we appreciate you signing in and learning more about the programs. Before we sign off, uh, just a quick note, we're going to be sending out the recording of this webinar to you as well, to all attendees, a link uh, so you can go back and, and watch it again. Uh, and please feel free to share it with your network when you do get the link. But if you have any questions that we didn't address, you can email info at sprotshaw.com. That's info at sprotshaw.com. Uh, or, of course, if an advisor from one of, the, one of our various campuses sent you to the webinar this evening, please circle back and chat with your advisor directly, and they'll be able to walk through the next steps for you. We'll see you next time. Have a great evening.